Okay, so you gotta you gotta tell me about this living in a tent in Montana. Living in a teepee in Montana. Teepee. <laughs> well, uh, my mom moved to Montana to a town of about 850 people, and it was I'd say 13 or 14 years ago. And so the first time I went out to visit her, uh, she and her new husband lived in a tiny little. Um, it's a little mining house from the 1800s, mm -hmm. so it's probably about the size of this room, total. <laughs> and so when I came out to visit, there was nowhere for me to stay because they slept up in the little loft that was shallow enough that you could really only sit up in it. You couldn't stand uh -huh. in it, and you had to climb a ladder to get up to the loft and sleep up there. So that was where they were, and uh, there was, they didn't have another spot for me, but they did have a teepee in the backyard. And so... I lived in the teepee for about three and a half months or so, wow. and uh, in a town of 850 people, there's not a lot to do out there. So, <laughs> and like when you're in the teepee, um, whenever the sun came up, it would get so darn hot. As soon as it was like 7:30 in the morning, you'd be sweated out of there. So you had to get up. This is like a tent. Yeah, yeah, and then um, wow. you'd get like the the mist and the dew would kind of come through the canvas a little bit. So you'd get a little bit damp in the morning uh, and it would, you know, bake off of you. <laughs> and you made friends with all the spiders. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So I was living in, living the, in the teepee for about three and a half months writing songs and that's where I wrote the Switchblade Blues song. Because um, I was just reading a lot about Bonnie and Clyde back then mm -hmm. and just learning about their life. I'm like, man, that sounds really cool. That's exciting. Wish I could be like that, but I don't want to get shot at, and I don't want to shoot anything, and like, <laughs> I don't want to go to jail, so maybe I'll just write a song instead of do it, so, yeah. so that's what I did. No, was that what you were reading by firelight? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> when I was out, outside in the, in the teepee, yeah, yeah, it was wild stuff. So I imagine you're out there chopping your own firewood, too, so you'd be even more self-sufficient with that? Yeah, I mean, out, it, it, it was the summer, so you didn't really need much, um, and it stayed pretty light out there, but uh, yeah, like when I go out in the winter, we chop firewood and, and do that. Um, yeah, it's kind of nice because I grew up chopping wood. Uh, we heated with wood my whole life, so uh, when I moved a couple of years ago, I kind of missed doing it. Yeah. So mm -hmm. missed the form. Oh yeah. You gotta tell me too about this uh, trip you took with all your tri with your triumph. Oh. Um, yeah, my dad and I, uh, he, he had a bunch of old Triumph motorcycles when I was a kid, and we always used to work on them together. Um, so I'd be hanging out with all of his friends, so I'd be, you know, eight, nine years old, and uh, hanging out with my dad and his friends and all these guys up to, you know, 70, 80 years old, old, old first-generation bikers after World War II. Um, and they were all these Brit bike guys. They always liked the British bikes, and so we'd be wrenching on the bikes and things like that. But... Uh, so I grew up around him, and uh, so I have a 65 Triumph that my buddy Ryan and I worked on uh, to get up to shape to do this ride, and then we did about 800 miles on the 65 Triumph, and then he had a, a 70, I think his is a 71 Triumph Bonneville. Um, so we went from Virginia over to West Virginia to Wheeling and to Ohio, and then uh, south west corner of PA and then back to Virginia and then came back up to PA so with one minor leak <laughs> yeah that's pretty, the, that's pretty good for running since, an English bike that far. yeah <laughs> since the since the the rubbers that hold the tank on the frame were I don't know 40 50 years old or so they just got hard and condensed and so the tank actually lowered ever so slightly and then the bottom of it uh, was rubbing on the head bolt and uh, just rubbed the hole through it so we took it off and um, uh, got a, a tank uh, repair kit, and um, we actually drained the fuel out of my tank into my buddy's tank, and then we took my tank up into the hotel room and then patched it in the hotel room and put it on <laughs> the next day, and then it was able to ride it home. But it was kind of funny. That's critical thinking quick. <laughs> tell, tell them what your friends said. Oh, yeah, so we were riding, and my buddy Ryan pulled up next to me, and he pointed at my, my engine, and I looked down, and there was just gas everywhere. I'm like, oh, that ain't good. So we pulled over, and I uh, said, uh, well, should we get this fixed? And they're like, well, yeah, well, once we get to the next hotel, we'll, we'll work on fixing this. And I was like, well, how far is that? And it's about 80 miles. And I'm like, 
Am I gonna blow up or something? He's like, nah, just stuff a rag in it and you'll probably be okay. And I'm like, oh my god, my... Just, just don't smoke a cigarette. Yeah, my, right. my two master mechanic friends with a fuel leak between my legs and uh -huh. they're just like, yeah, just, just stuff a rag in it, you'll probably be okay. And you, oh, you still hear one and I was, You yeah, probably were. I remember I was telling people about it and and uh, Ryan was like, did the rag not work? And I'm like, no, it did. <laughs> Oh yeah. So I, yeah, like I said, I just I love I love experiences like that. I love old stuff, old people, old clothing, old stories. Anything older than me, I love it, and I try to keep it around for people so they don't forget yeah. about it. And you, you're pretty much a mechanic on these trials by now. No, I'm I'm not a mechanic. I I know enough to to get into trouble and sometimes out again. <laughs> like I I can I can you know keep keep mine going. Uh, yeah. But if we get into real in-depth stuff, like, um, uh, well, you know, like, I can do do some of the things, like a clutch and, you know, that kind of stuff. But if I'm getting into putting electronic ignition into something like that, then that's when I call my buddy Ryan or Randy and say, hey, bring me yeah. beer. Can you yep. Help me put this in. There's a 30-pack waiting. Show up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But the, yeah, yeah, Ryan and Randy are the, the, the ace mechanics. They're the ones you want to go to if you got yeah. something old. Um, so I'm a lucky guy to be able to have them as friends. And, yeah, and how did you meet them? Were they lifelong friends? Or? Um, I met uh, Ryan in college. I went to college in Kutztown. And uh, we were both uh, walking to class one day in opposite directions. And we both, I think we both had Triumph shirts on. <laughs> and we had the old Triumph shirts because the logo swoops around the H at the end. Yeah. Whereas the new one comes up under and just kind of stops. And so you kind of have to be in the know to know the difference between the two. And so we walked by and like kind of gave each other a look and then turned around and like, you got old tribes? Like, yeah, you got one? Yeah. You want to get a coffee? Okay. <laughs> so then we just started talking. And so I think we've known each other about 10 years or so, maybe a little longer. And then uh, Randy's a uh, good buddy of Ryan's. And I, I met him several years ago at... Uh, swap meets we do vintage swap meets and i play a lot of shows at motorcycle rallies and things and so he's there and so i've known him for a uh, couple of years but really got to like you know know the fella yeah. better over over the course of the, the motorcycle ride and, and stuff like that he runs a restoration business mm. um in virginia doing pretty much anything you can oh, so you had to leave from here and go to Virginia and meet him, or did you all be in one spot? Yeah, we uh, Ryan and I uh, put the bikes in the truck and then drove them down, and then we mm -hmm. left from there and did the 800 miles and then loaded them back in the truck and came back up. Just because wow. when you're on an old bike, and, you know, like mine doesn't have turn signals, and, you know, if you're doing the hand signals, nobody knows what this stuff means anymore. Not anymore, And they're no. <laughs> texting half the time, so, like... We would we would try to avoid the crazy roads, you know, around cities and stuff. And sometimes you just can't. Like they're yeah. depending where you are, you you have to go through that stuff. So we thought, well, let's just get out of the cities and then and start from down south. Yeah. Yeah. You wanted to make it down there too, right, to the Blue Ridge Parkway? Yeah, yeah. we we wanted to do that, but during the COVID stuff, actually, I think part of it was shut down. Mm -hmm. um, and we wanted to go to the one museum down in, uh, I think it was North Carolina, the Wheels Through Time, mm -hmm. but they were closed too because of the COVID stuff. So we had all this planned for about a year, year and a half yeah. of things we wanted to do, and then it like all got shot to heck, you know. And not because of this, yeah. Yeah, so we just said, well, let's let's go that way until we feel like turning. <laughs> yeah. And we'll, we'll go that way some more. Was it hard finding any hotels, or I imagine they're still pretty well open with all that? They were, they were all pretty much open, and uh, they were really, you know, inexpensive, especially if you're splitting it three ways, mm -hmm. um, and people just weren't traveling. Uh, so, you know, we'd be, be able to get a hotel for sometimes like 50 bucks. Really? Um, and then split it, and yeah, I think the, the whole 800-mile trip maybe cost me 40 bucks in gas or something like that. <laughs> wow. And uh, it's it's a neat feeling to have everything you need in a tiny little duffel bag that big on the back of the bike. Yeah. And like when it starts raining and we had all sorts of rain. Mm -hmm. Um we went through pretty much every every weather condition except for snow and hail. <laughs> that would, yeah, that would have made it a lot worse. Yeah. <laughs> Tornadoes? <laughs> well, we had some heavy wind. I've I've had stuff where I'd be riding the bike and get a wind gust that would blow you into the other lane and you got yeah. Or like you're kind of the wind's blowing and you're kind of in a half a lean to 
keep it going straight. Yeah. Sounds scary. On an English bike that has how, how many feet of stopping power would you say do you have to play for like three hundred feet oh, with those I, disc drums you have on it's it? It's tough, yeah. It's got it's got two drum brakes on it, front and rear. Um and so if if you're if you're riding that thing, you just you don't really stop in the same zip code. You you gotta plan ahead and you gotta do a lot of engine braking, shifting down and kind of finesse it. Yeah, like you say, kind of plan for your stop. Yes, yeah, so you, you don't really abuse the thing because you know it's old and stops slow but you know I've I think the newest bike I've ever ridden was probably 1976 or, or 7 or something and that only had one uh, disc brake in the front so that didn't stop much better so I'm kind of used mm -hmm. to it uh, but yeah it takes a while you don't you don't want to run yeah. up on something fast yeah, it's a different different animal. That's for sure. You're probably not as fast. You're probably what maybe 65 is max on them, or do you... no? I've, I mean, I've hit 100 on them on really? before. That's that's where mine kind of tops out. Uh -huh. A lot of the old British bike guys, uh, they'd have like the old cafe racer scene where they'd be racing them and stuff, and they uh, they always said you wanted to do. They had two phrases for it: uh, ton up, which was you hit 100 miles an hour, mm -hmm. or count the dollar which was hit 100 miles an hour, and that was kind of like the magic number that was, you know, obtainable, but you had to work for it sometimes. Um, so, yeah, you can you can hit 100, but you don't want to, you know, flog the thing. Yeah. So I, I think I could probably do about 70, 75 on it without hurting it too much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's got four gears, so you can't, can't really go too out of line with it. Yeah. <laughs> And it shifts it, on it the shift, right. Yeah, it shifts on the left. You told me about it. Well, it it's shifts been, on yeah. the right. Yeah, this side. Because most new bikes will shift on the left. Yeah. But this one, it shifts on the right. You can see the, the shift marks. And this is from the Kickstarter. That big old smudge on that is from the Kickstarter. And yeah, I don't it, know if they'll be able to see that on camera, but those are cool, uh, cool boots. Oh, thank you. Yeah, these, these are uh, West Coast lineman boots. My, my buddy Mike sells these. I don't know if you guys can see this on camera, but these are the coolest <laughs> boots you're ever going to find. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. I love them. These were, and you said they're really comfortable too, which yeah. is surprising. Well, really durable. Yeah. Well, this uh, a lot of the lineman boots they had, you know, other stuff to them, and but um, since Mike uh, sells them, we actually kind of designed parts of these to be for motorcycle riders. Because mm -hmm. uh, every year there's what they call the cannonball, or not every year. Every two years they have the cannonball race where they have these guys on hundred year old motorcycles go from coast to coast, and they do it, and you know kind of a fast time on an old bike like that that you got to pump oil into by hand because it's a total loss system and a lot of them will do it in vintage clothing so they'll be looking like me riding a hundred year old bike uh -huh. and uh, so uh, Mike does the clothing for that stuff so he does like the riding pants and the hats and the boots and stuff like that and we we uh, designed these to replicate stuff that would have they would have had a hundred years ago mm -hmm. um, but yeah, designed basically off of off of the lineman boots. Yeah. Everything he sells is really amazing, and most uh, boot companies that you find out there, they'll fall apart in like one year mm -hmm. or less, even of hard work. But the West Coast apparently are incredibly. Strong. Oh, they're amazing. Yeah. He's probably using true traditional leather, probably doing it that way. Yeah. Not well, just everything high quality. Uh, fake leather or anything. Either. Yeah, I mean, uh, he Mike's got a pair that he's had for twenty years already. So like you wear them for five years or so, and then get them resold, and wear them for another five years, and you do it over and over and over again. Um, but yeah, like his he's uh, his company his uh, business is called Golden Age Motorcycle Clothing. Uh, so he's got like like he gave me this hat, and I got the boots from him and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. I'm I'm a lucky guy to have the friends I do. Yeah, you do. yes, you are, especially <laughs> on that trip. Yeah, <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't have been able to do stuff like that if it weren't for for the people I know because like that old stuff it's hard to keep it running and you know when my dad passed away I lost a lot of the knowledge that I never you know paid attention to mm -hmm. um, fully when I was a kid um, so it's it's really neat to have friends that are willing to help you uh, do stuff and, and keep you going like a lot of the music stuff I do I I couldn't do it if it weren't for the people and all the support yeah. that they do was it your dad that taught you the banjo yeah, my dad played, he was a musician for uh, 30 years, um, and he played all sorts of stuff, but primarily the claw hammer banjo, the frailing style. Yeah, you said that's an Appalachian style? I think yeah, pretty much. It's, yeah. Uh, it's, it's real popular with the Appalachian stuff. A lot of people 
think of like the bluegrass finger picking scrug stuff, and that's really fast. So that's the different stuff. But claw hammer, it's with the whole hand. It's kind of pretty much all down strokes. Right. Um, but he he played a bunch of banjo, and he taught me how to do it, and so I kept it going. Yeah, it's awesome style. It's not something you hear a lot anymore. Yeah, a lot of it, people like don't you said do the it. five finger the five finger pick on the uh, five string. That's more of the yeah more of what you hear when you hit Nashville and stuff. But the Appalachian style, I've only ever heard from you. I haven't, I've, I've, but I've never really researched it. Now. There's you can find it out there. I mean, it's a little harder to do because uh, or not harder to do, but harder to find. It's it's not quite as popular. But I just love how it sounds. Yeah, I actually kind of prefer it to to mm. the the three finger fast picking and stuff because it sounds claw hammer sounds kind of like raindrops almost yeah, yeah. um mm -hmm. and it's it's really neat because you know it was the working people's style you know yeah the old coal miners and, yeah you know, no yeah and mountain people yeah they used to they would play like uh fretless banjos they'd they'd go out and um, find a stump and then burn a hole down straight through the center of it and then cut the ring off and then make a banjo out of that and uh, all sorts of different ways to do to to do mountain banjos. I, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Do the songs that traditionally go with that style of banjo teach you about its history, the history of the style of banjo? Like, are there specific songs that are written for a claw hammer? Yeah, yeah. There's a there was a lot of stuff that was pretty specifically claw hammer. Um, I don't know if it talks about the history of it but you you kind of feel it when you're playing it and listening to it because it's such a specific thing it's a, it's a specific sound and feel that really lends itself well to the Appalachian style music mm -hmm. so uh, yeah it's it's got its own lineage that you can kind of just get a, a sense for it yeah mm -hmm. which is cool and your harmonica playing your dad taught you that too right no I uh, I actually learned that to impress a girl in college. Um, sorry, babe. <laughs> but uh, I I forget what it was. I was I was doing something. I I forget what it was. And she's like, "Do you have? A, is that a harmonica?" And I'm like, "No." So I went, <laughs> I went and bought one, and I, I tried to learn it. And then I started listening to people like Little Walter. And I'm like, "Oh my God, this is the coolest <laughs> instrument ever." Uh -huh. And so it, what started as like a you know, kind of a novelty just turned into something that I really respected. You know, a mm -hmm. lot of those harp players are incredible musicians. Yeah. And especially like little Walter, that, that man was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Wish I could have met him. Um, so yeah, I just, uh, I learned a lot of harmonica f just from listening to the records and trying to figure out how to bend notes and, mm -hmm. and, and how to do it that way. And, you know, you find yourself getting into patterns where you do the same four or five or six different tricks and you try to listen to another harp player and steal a trick they got and, and do like, you have your your bag of you know 20 something different key harmonicas like I see a lot of them have um or you just I, I really stick to mostly three mm -hmm. um for the for a lot of the blues keys like if uh if I'm playing a song in the key of E I'll play an A harp do cross harp. Um, so I really only have, well I have I think seven or eight of them, but I really only play a, an A, D, and a G harmonica. Um, so those are the ones I wear out the most. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they're expensive now. They're pretty pricey. But, I don't have it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Harmonica, banjo, motorcycles, and all <laughs> sorts of stuff. Old clothing. What's wrong with that, man? To each as well. Yeah. I haven't even properly introduced you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Chris LaRose. Well, hi. Emily Neblock. I'm not saying that wrong, correct? Okay. That is correct. Okay. Neblock. Yep. And Giddy's back there. I'm probably wondering what in the world is going on right now. <laughs> hi, Giddy. It's a custom talk show. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty talk much. Talk Just having a conversation. <laughs> you have to you want, do you guys want to tell you where you can find yourselves? Well, Wrap oh. it up, or do you guys, you guys something? We can keep talking. Man. Well, uh, I got plenty of room left on my computer. Oh, well, cool. <laughs> um, I have a, I have a website. It's, it's chrislarosemusic.com, and then I think you have one, don't you? Yeah, the best place to get my music right now is emilyneblock.bandcamp.com, and it's N-E-B-L-O-C-K, Neblock. 
An interesting fact is Emily uh, is actually the bass player in my blues band. Mm -hmm. It's uh, Chris LaRose and the Hex Highway Blues Band. So we do a lot of the old 40s and 50s and early 60s, like Muddy Waters, Howlin' mm -hmm. Wolf kind of stuff. And but you're still doing the originals, though, right? With it? Yeah, yeah, we do some mm -hmm. of the originals, and we're, we're trying to um, add more stuff every time we play. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we do do shows about three, four hours long and with the old stuff and some originals. and. And M sings a lot for the. Yeah. Uh, you guys have stuff. a great combination when it comes to this. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I got to see you guys so full band line. Yeah. 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 You guys will see the. It's I'm so hoping to bring them to town sometime. Yeah. Once once this this lockdown stuff opens up and we can actually get out and do shows and have people show up, that'd be cool. So. Well, place you're at tonight, he was asking to play the backyard party, so. Yeah. It's yeah. Also, we could make it happen there as long as we don't have noise ordinances. Right yeah. Around. And the band stuff is on Facebook, uh, if you search for Hex Highway Blues Band. Mm -hmm. That's the best way to get that right now. Yeah, Chris Lorenz and the Hex Highway Blues Band. Yeah. All right. Cool. Check out the music. Thank you. We're done. <laughs> You're going to take photos now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you. Nice to meet you.